October the 20th, Jeremiah 35, 1 through 36, 32. This is the message the Lord gave Jeremiah when Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, was the king of Judah. Go to the settlement where the families of the Rechabites live and invite them to the temple. Take them into one of the inner rooms and offer them a drink of wine. So I went over to see Jehazaniah, son of Jeremiah, who was the son of Habazaniah, and brought him and all his brothers and sons, representing all the Rechab families, to the temple, into the room assigned for the use of the sons of Hanan the prophet, the son of Igdaliah. This room was located next to the one used by the palace official, directly above the room of Maaseah, son of Shalom, who was the temple doorman. I set cups and jugs of wine before them and invited them to have a drink, but they refused. No, they said, we don't drink, for Jonadab, our father, son of Rechab, commanded that none of us should ever drink, neither we nor our children forever. He also told us not to build houses or plant crops or vineyards and not to own farms, but always to live in tents and that if we obeyed, we would live long, good lives in our own land. And we have obeyed him in all these things. We have never had a drink of wine since then, nor our wives or our sons or daughters either. We haven't built houses or owned farms or planted crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed everything that Jonadab our father commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, arrived in this country, we were afraid and decided to move to Jerusalem. That's why we are here. Then the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. The Lord of hosts... The God of Israel says, Go and say to Judah and Jerusalem, Won't you learn a lesson from the families of Rechab? They don't drink because their father told them not to. But I have spoken to you again and again, and you won't listen or obey. I have sent you prophet after prophet to tell you to turn back from your wicked ways and to stop worshiping other gods, and that if you obeyed, then I would let you live in peace here in the land I gave to you and your fathers. But you wouldn't listen or obey. The families of Rechab have obeyed their father completely, but you have refused to listen to me. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, says, Because you refuse to listen or answer when I call, I will send upon Judah and Jerusalem all the evil I have ever threatened. Then Jeremiah turned to the Rechabites and said, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says that because you have obeyed your father in every respect, he shall always have descendants who will worship me. In the fourth year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, son of Josiah, the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. Get a scroll and write down all my messages against Israel, Judah, and the other nations. Begin with the first message back in the days of Josiah and write down every one of them. Perhaps when the people of Judah see in writing all the terrible things I will do to them, they will repent and then I can forgive them. So Jeremiah sent for Barak, son of Neriah, and as Jeremiah dictated, Barak wrote down all the prophecies. When all was finished, Jeremiah said to Barak, Since I am a prisoner here, you read the scroll in the temple on the next day of fasting, for on that day people will be there from all over Judah. Perhaps even yet they will turn from their evil ways and ask the Lord to forgive them before it is too late, even though these curses of God have been pronounced upon them. Barak did as Jeremiah told him to, and read all these messages to the people at the temple. This occurred on the day of fasting held in December of the fifth year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah. People came from all over Judah to attend the services at the temple that day. Barak went to the office of Gemariah, the scribe, son of Shaphan, to read the scroll. This room was just off the upper assembly hall of the temple, near the door of the new gate. When Micaiah, son of Gemariah, son of Shaphan, heard the messages from God, he went down to the palace to the conference room where the administrative officials were meeting. Elishama the scribe was there, as well as Delaiah, son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, son of Akbor, Gemariah, son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, son of Hananiah, and all the others with similar responsibilities. When Micaiah told them about the messages Barak was reading to the people, the officials sent Jehudai, son of Nethaniah, son of Shelemiah, son of Cushai, to ask Barak to come and read the messages to them too, and Barak did. By the time he finished, they were badly frightened. We must tell the king. But first, tell us how you got these messages. Did Jeremiah himself dictate them to you? So Barak explained that Jeremiah had dictated them to him, word by word, and he had written them down in ink upon the scroll. You and Jeremiah both hide. Don't tell a soul where you are. Then the officials hid the scroll in the room of Elishama, the scribe, and went to tell the king. The king sent Jehudai to get the scroll. Jehudai brought it from Elishama the scribe and read it to the king as all his officials stood by.
The king was in a winterized part of the palace at the time, sitting in front of a fireplace, for it was December and cold. And whenever Jehudai finished reading three or four columns, the king would take his knife and slit off the section and throw it into the fire until the whole scroll was destroyed. And no one protested except Elnathan, Delaiah, and Gemariah. They pled with the king not to burn the scroll, but he wouldn't listen to them. Not another of the king's officials showed any signs of fear or anger at what he had done. Then the king commanded Jeramiel, a member of the royal family, and Saraiah, son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, son of Abdiel, to arrest Barak and Jeremiah. But the Lord hid them. After the king had burned the scroll, the Lord said to Jeremiah, Get another scroll, and write everything again just as you did before, and say this to the king. The Lord says you burned the scroll because it said the king of Babylon would destroy this country and everything in it. And now the Lord adds this concerning you, Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He shall have no one to sit upon the throne of David. His dead body shall be thrown out to the hot sun and frosty nights, and I will punish him and his family and his officials because of their sins. I will pour out upon them all the evil I promised, upon them and upon all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, for they wouldn't listen to my warnings. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and dictated again to Barak all he had written before. Only this time the Lord added a lot more. First Timothy 5, 1 through 25. Never speak sharply to an older man, but plead with him respectfully, just as though he were your own father. Talk to the younger men as you would to much-loved brothers. Treat the older women as mothers and the girls as your sisters, thinking only pure thoughts about them. The church should take loving care of women whose husbands have died if they don't have anyone else to help them. But if they have children or grandchildren, these are the ones who should take the responsibility. For kindness should begin at home, supporting needy parents. This is something that pleases God very much. The church should care for widows who are poor and alone in the world if they are looking to God for his help and spending much time in prayer. But not if they are spending their time running around gossiping, seeking only pleasure, and thus ruining their souls. This should be your church rule so that the Christians will know and do what is right. But anyone who won't care for his own relatives when they need help, especially those living in his own family, has no right to say he is a Christian. Such a person is worse than the heathen. A widow who wants to become one of the special church workers should be at least 60 years old and have been married only once. She must be well thought of by everyone because of the good she has done. Has she brought up her children well? Has she been kind to strangers as well as to other Christians? Has she helped those who are sick and hurt? Is she always ready to show kindness? The younger widows should not become members of this special group because after a while they are likely to disregard their vow to Christ and marry again. And so they will stand condemned because they broke their first promise. Besides, they are likely to be lazy and spend their time gossiping around from house to house, getting into other people's business. So I think it is better for these younger widows to marry again and have children and take care of their own homes. Then no one will be able to say anything against them. For I am afraid that some of them have already turned away from the church and been led astray by Satan. Let me remind you again that a widow's relatives must take care of her and not leave this to the church to do. Then the church can spend its money for the care of widows who are all alone and have nowhere else to turn. Pastors who do their work well should be paid well and should be highly appreciated, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For the scriptures say, never tie up the mouth of an ox when it is treading out the grain. Let him eat as he goes along. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. Don't listen to complaints against the pastor unless there are two or three witnesses to accuse him. If he has really sinned, then he should be rebuked in front of the whole church so that no one else will follow his example. I solemnly command you in the presence of God and the Lord Jesus Christ and of the holy angels to do this, whether the pastor is a special friend of yours or not. All must be treated exactly the same. Never be in a hurry about choosing a pastor. You may overlook his sins, and it will look as if you approve of them. Be sure that you yourself stay away from all sin. By the way, this doesn't mean you should completely give up drinking wine. You ought to take a little sometimes as medicine for your stomach, because you are sick so often. Remember that some men, even pastors, lead sinful lives, and everyone knows it. In such situations, you can do something about it. But in other cases, only the judgment day will reveal the terrible truth.
In the same way, everyone knows how much good some pastors do, but sometimes their good deeds aren't known until long afterward. Proverbs for today, 25, 25 through 27. Good news from far away is like cold water to the thirsty. If a godly man compromises with the wicked, it is like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. Just as it is harmful to eat too much honey, so also it is bad for men to think about all the honors they deserve.